At the moment, uh, uh, we have only 13 participants, so probably it's better to wait uh, just uh, one or two minutes if uh, we have a uh, other person because uh, we know that uh, we were waiting for about uh, 30 person. In any case, uh, the e seminar uh, cons will concern the use of model to predict the effect of large, large scale pressures on river morphology, biota, and the potential of rich scale restoration. Uh, Jochen Kehl, uh, which is uh, uh, the coordinator of the impact project, uh, will uh, uh, summarize the main result of this uh, research project. Uh, and uh, at uh, the end, uh, we have uh, uh, time for question and uh, to clarify everything uh, with uh, Jochen. Uh, bef before Jochen, we have uh, uh, another presentation, Gagnon del Office International de Law, which is the coordinator of the Water This project. Uh, will uh, uh, have uh, uh, a presentation uh, um, with a, an, an introduction on what are these uh, main result, and uh, uh, she also will give us uh, some uh, uh, a short training on, on the use of Adobe Connect for people who are not used uh, with uh, this kind of instrument. Uh, If Gael uh, wants uh, to start uh, uh, her presentation, we, we can go. But uh, uh, I see, okay. Gael, okay, if yeah. you want to go, we are, we are ready and, uh, and uh, at, at the end of your presentation, I, I will try to report uh, uh, questions. Pe participants uh, who want uh, to have question can uh, uh, write them in the chat. I, I see the, the question or uh, if they prefer at the end of the presentation they can talk uh, with uh, Gael directly. We can open their um, microphone. So Gael, uh, you can go. Thank you. Okay, just to be sure, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. So, uh, um, good morning everybody. I'm Gail Nyon, the Water Disc Coordinator. And I will just start uh, one minute on the um, functioning of, of Adobe Connect. So, if you uh, would like to uh, ask uh, for speaking or ask a question, uh, on the top of your screen, you should have a little symbols, and you have one. If you click on the um, on the top, you have raise your hand. Uh, so, if you want to speak or to ask a question, you can click on this one, and it will be displayed uh, near your name. Uh, and to be able to speak, I think Bruno, you have to enable the audio of the participants, and after you have a symbol of a microphone. If it's in gray, we cannot hear you, and if it's in green, we can hear you. You just have to click on. Uh, okay. For the questions, you can put them, uh, I don't know, on the, on the chat. Okay? Yes. Well, you can write your question on the chat, and uh, Bruno will moderate. So, we will start by the water this presentation. Okay, you can see it? It's okay? Yes. Okay. So, uh, what is this? So, the context, rationale, and results. So, the goal of uh, what is this is to test and develop methods, tools, uh, and to formulate recommendations to improve the dissemination process within uh, European projects. The consortium is made of eight partners. 
uh, what it is is a three-year project with an approximative budget of 1 billion and 200,000 euros of which 490,000 euros dedicated to direct dissemination actions which is very different from the dissemination strategy and the dissemination process so we'll see that after we had analyzed 60 uh, research outputs, conducted uh, 25 individual dissemination strategies and organized more than 50 events. So the project also found uh, a communication platform, the European Water Community, Community so EWC in short, and we have made publications and articles. So the context. The science policy interface and uh, challenges. As you could see, interaction between researchers and policymakers is limited by the divergence of these two worlds. Academics often have a limited access to real policymaker needs and lack awareness of benefits from learning more about these. Policy and research have different time scales, and the question of the capacity building is important too or to store access all the knowledge produced by the research and get dynamic scientific state of the art. The main goal of the science policy interface could be the following. How to get knowledge in hands and minds of policymakers and implementers. So the science po policy interface, the principles or to ensure the results of research fulfills the needs, the, re the research needs would mean. Science policy interface should be understood taking into account the research cycle scale. The research cycle starts from the identification of the research needs, needs to the uptake of research outputs. The main components of this cycle are the identification of the research needs. So you can see it at the beginning of the green uh, part. The core documents, including among other guidelines on dissemination, then the project building. This is an essential step. Projects are built to tackle specific scientific issues and should integrate core dissemination recommendations. The last point is the implementation of the disseminations. Researchers produce tools, methods, they should disseminate. Conceptually, the implementation of dissemination activities should be done during project course and after the end of the project. Regarding uh, the dissemination uh, and the example of the FP7 project, the guidelines are very important. In the FP7 guidelines for dissemination, an effective dissemination of results is defined as an essential part of the research project. This ensures that the gained knowledge or exploitable foreground can benefit the whole society and not only the researchers, and that any duplication of research and development activities is avoided. The dissemination of results is usually targeted towards the scientific community and industry. However, it might be a benefit to look outside the box, as there are plenty of others who might be interested in what the project is doing, such as the media, policy makers, and general public. Dissemination actions in the FP7 guidelines as are resumed as followed. A project website, a project newsletter, press releases, more interactive communication should be pursued via social media and uh, researchers have, have to in, inform the European Commission of any success stories. So according to these guidelines, how is dissemination being done at the moment? Most of the time within the framework of research projects, there continues to be heavy reliance on articles in scientific journals which are inaccessible to potential users of the findings. Conferences, reports and websites are also almost universally used to tell users about research findings. Early uh, and focused engagement with stakeholders is much less common most investigators do not attempt to build a community of practice 
with the key stakeholders and users in government and industry. The limited effectiveness in this process can be attributed, attributed among others to shortcomings in the uptake of large quantity of new knowledge which are never used by the policymakers. So what's the problem with the science dissemination? The outcomes of research into water research problem funding by the European Commission have often been very slow to be taken up by practitioners. The use of dissemination channels is often limited to those commonly used. Access and use of new ones remains a slow and incomplete process for many European projects. Some projects, however, have explored these new channels and dissemination efforts become more decentralized and more multifaceted. The identification of relevant target group is uh, often incomplete. The target group is the group you want to disseminate uh, the results of your research. The definition of their behavior regarding access to information is a crucial point to be taken into account in the dissemination strategy of a project. Repetitive but superficial messages are being delivered and scientific are often overloaded with the task of communicating. It follows that the research has not had expected impacts in many cases. So the dissemination of research output is a necessary intrinsic project process. Communication and dissemination strategy at the project scale is a crucial issue to be taken into account by project consortiums. The dissemination should be seen, sorry, the dissemination should be seen as a strategy, not as a only one or two actions or a succession of actions. This is a strategy to be drafted and conducted from the beginning of each project for each output produced, not for all the project, shared by all project partners and receiving funds needed for effective implementation. So now we know more about the water discount Text, but what about the tools and methods developed within WaterDIS? So, according to, to the state of the heart, um, and to answer to this need, the WaterDIS project aims at creating a new service for research output uptake, like an intermediate step between research producers and research end users. Under the banner of the Science Policy Interface, the WaterDIS project supports dissemination and innovation processes and help key actors to more quickly improve processes and methodologies in water management. So, the first water disc tool. Um, the design of an individual dissemination strategy, so the IDS, is the basis of the intermediate step between researchers and water stakeholders. An IDS is developed um, to analyze and promote one research output. It is focused on the output, on the outcome of the project, and not on the project itself. The goal is to define how to match research outputs with the targeted audiences and their specific needs and the content, um, media, formats, and language to develop for a better dissemination. The goal is to get the outcomes into the hands and minds of the targeted audience. The IDS, so Individual Dissemination Strategy process, is subdivided in three items. The first focuses on the output itself, and by analyzing it in details, it becomes uh, easier to define the target groups and the end users the action to implement, and the means to mobilize. For each of these steps, everything is detailed in a list, and the list of to-do is established. OK, so just a little part of uh, an, a completed IDS. <coughs> For example, here you could appreciate the level of details of the information collected. Uh, we focus on the characterization of uh, the target groups. 
Uh, on the left column, several key questions guide the interviewers in qualifying the target groups. The first step is to define the relevant end users using a generic list provided in Annex. The next step is to identify precisely the organizations and institutions to be contacted. And the third one deals with the identification of key multipliers, the good contacts in each organization. So at this stage, you have the name of the person you should contact. When the good contact has been met, we could identify the good ways of communication and channel to use to promote research outputs. On the right side, and related to each of the previous points, you can see a list of to-do. This list is, es is essential for the implementation of the IDS because it guaranteed its operationality. <clears throat> As an example, an IDS has been developed within uh, the GeoLand 2 project. The output concern is called the EI model. So you can see here the page of um, the EI model. Starting from an interview with the coordinator of GeoLand 2 project and then from an interview with the person in charge of the development of the model, which could be very different, uh, generate different points of view. Uh, we have drafted an individual dissemination strategy. The implementation of these ideas leads to the presentation of the model at the World Water Forum 6 and during other specific events in Dublin. The drafting of an output fact sheet synthesizing the most relevant information and the setting online of uh, a video like you can see here. So you are uh, currently on the page of the European Water Community. So all this information is available on a dedicated page on this community, like for 50 other outputs. The objective is to gather information on the maximum of water research outputs. They are all presented like that. Um, to constitute a dynamic and operational library accessible to all water stakeholders. The European Water Community is a collaborative platform focused on European water issues. The objective of this platform are to store water-related documents and to be a portal to access to water research output directly and not to the project themselves. It guarantees the operational level of the information available. So the European Water Community is one of the tools developed within WaterDisk. Dissemination in practice. So, this team has organized more than 50 events in uh, not three years because this is the duration of the project, but uh, more in two years. <laughs> we have used the first year to build our strategy. During these events, we have tested many kinds of strategy f strategies for reaching our targets achieving animation and promotion of water research outputs. These experiences and feedbacks have generated the formulation of different kinds of materials. <coughs> so several guides have been edited using feedbacks collected during these events. For example, we have built an e-seminar guide a series of recommendations are in drafting recommendations towards scientists on how to manage European project dissemination and uh, uh, the list, but the less important recommendations to the European Commission on how to support dissemination of producing in the course. Uh, recommendations more precise and maybe more directives. All these reports uh, will be available uh, in February. So I really would like to thank you for your attention and participation to uh, this e-seminar. Uh, maybe you have some questions or uh, to formulate because I have to leave now. <laughs> So uh, I have 
some minutes to answer your question if you have. Thank you. Thank you for applause. Any question? <laughs> <laughs> Only a applause, not not yes, question for girl. Yes, yes. I think we have one and uh, raised. No, I have seen. Uh, no. I I don't see question in the chat. So one who raised the end. Okay, you you can note my email address. Um, which is on the current slide and if you have uh, if you want to take contact to uh, discuss about these questions of dissemination promotion communication within European project you can uh, write me an email and it will be a pleasure to uh, to exchange with you thank you very much Gael. Uh, thank you very much to you we know Okay, we know you have to go now, so we can go on with our next speaker. Just the time to Elisa to change the presentation. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, we can go with uh, the technical part of the uh, e seminar uh, concerning the use of models. Uh, very important and in the same time uh, difficult uh, uh, task to discuss uh, uh, today with uh, our speaker Joachim. Okay, I think uh, we are ready to go. Joachim, you can go. Okay, okay the first question of course is can, uh, can you hear me, Bruno? Yes. So, am I connected? Okay, so. And, and also um, to see you. Okay, and you can see the the first slide. Yes. yes. If so one have problem can chat because for me everything is okay. Okay. So do you also see the the, the mouse pointer? Do you also see the the mouse pointer? So the uh, Yes, yes. Yes, okay, yes. So that, you are mo you are that, moving in the title. Okay. Yes, okay, that's okay. So, I mute uh, my microphone and I will stop you only if uh, I see some question uh, which uh, are important in that moment and that uh, can't be uh, done at the end. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so first of all uh, a warm welcome to everybody from my side and of course I would like to thank uh, what it is and Bruno and Andrea for giving me the opportunity to present the impact project to you. As Bruno mentioned, the project that end, has ended last month, but we are still in the phase of finalizing the project and doing some model runs and um, compiling all the results. So. What I will present you today is a kind of um, preliminary final results of the project. And um, first of all, I would like to start to introduce the people who work in this project. And we are a small uh, EU project. We are only six partners. So we have the, the IGB, where, which is coordinating the project. And I was just recently Moving, moving from the IGB to the University of Essen. That's why I'm listed here as an IGB member. We have hydrologists from the University of Kiel, uh, um, and we have invertebrologists from the University of Essen. We have some people from France, from the University Paul Sabatier. We have Portuguese partners from CCMAR. Uh, who are working on one of our study catchments and some colleagues, some Dutch colleagues were helping us with the morphodynamics and hydrodynamics. So this is the core team um, of the IMPACT project. So first of all I would like to tell you something about the modeling approach and the background. I will present the modeling framework and then I will 
give more detailed information on the different model compartments which you can see here on the top. And finally, I will say something about the biological assessment that we are doing at the end of this modeling chain. So what is the background? The main background is that we have different pressures at different spatial scales which affect river biota. So if you have this river reach here in the center of this figure, this is affected by river training, so by channelization or by bank revetment. And this, of course, affects the habitat conditions and biota of the river. But we also have pressures at other spatial scales. So, for example, there are migration barriers in the river network. Um, we have missing source populations which cannot colonize this reach. And at the catchment scale, we have well-known pressures like, for, for example, diffuse pollution, point uh, pollution. And at the global scale, we have a um, new upcoming pressure, which is climate change. So in what we do with river restoration uh, generally is that we address a reach scale pressure. So we are restoring hydromorphology at a reach scale. But usually, we are not able to really address these large scale pressures like catchment land use. So we are not really changing land use in the catchment to an extent which really has an effect, positive effect uh, at a reach scale. So another way of looking at this in a more conceptual approach is to consider these different pressures as landscape filters. So starting from the left, this is kind of the um, list of species with, which naturally would occur in our study catchment. And these species have to pass different filters before they can establish, really can establish at a reach scale. So for example, we've got, we have global pressures like climate change, which will cause this list to be shorter. We have catchment pressures like land use. Again, the list is shorter. We've got river network pressures like migration barriers. Again, the list of species is shorter. And finally, we have reach scale pressures, which, um, which limit the number of species. And with reach scale restoration, we can just affect some of the species which are not limited by the other pressures. But there are many species uh, which will not occur in our study reach, even if, if we restore the habitats because there are other pressures at larger spatial scales which are limiting these species. OK, this is the basic background and idea of the project. And we also have statistical then that these large scale pressures really affect biota. What you see on, on the left side is just a scatter plot where you have the share of the urban land use on the x-axis and some description or metric of the ecological status on the y-axis. And you can see that if the share of urban land use increases, the ecological status decreases. So even if, and it's, it's, it's a limiting um, variable. So even if you have, for example, a good hydromorphological state, you will obviously not reach a good ecological status uh, if you have high share of urban land use in the catchment. There's a similar graph on the, on the right side only looking at the sensitive taxa. So this is this uh, black line here. And here you can see that there is a sharp drop of, of the sensitive taxa if we exceed a share of urban land use in the catchment of about 4%. So this these are graphs from uh, one of my own studies, but there are many, many studies which show that urban land use obviously is limiting biota. And they are very similar if you classify them as in studies looking at biological metrics. So here the threshold is about 15% urban land use. Or if you only consider studies which look at sensitive taxa, and here the threshold is about 5% urban land use. 
So based on this empirical data, the research question in impact was to use a modeling approach to get a better idea what are the underlying mechanisms. So the, the idea is to investigate what is the relative importance of these different pressures and which of them is really the bottleneck for biota. And also to look at climate and land use change and assess the effect uh, these changes have on biota. And finally to discuss what you can expect from reach scale restoration giving the remaining pressures in the catchment. And as I said before, we did this by coupling different models, so models which describe processes at different spatial scales. And of course, one of the main objectives of modeling is that you are uh, using scenarios to, to investigate what happens if you change the input of the models. And we tested this in three different catchments and we, we use used near natural reaches as a kind of um, proxy to describe the uh, um, habit conditions that you can reach uh, in a restored uh, stream segment. So these are our three study reaches and I would like to focus in this presentation on the Träne simply because it would take too long to describe all the results for all the different catchments. In the Träne catchment we have uh, climate change data from the so-called star scenarios. Um, this is a method to downscale the, the climate uh, models uh, at the global scale to regional scale and the very specific aspect of this star downscaling is that you have that we have 100 different climate change runs which allows us to do some more statistical um, analysis. We have a baseline scenario where we assume no change in temperature in the modeling period which is from 21 to 60 and we have a climate change scenario which is rather pessimistic um, and this is an increase of three degrees in temperature. Besides these climate change scenarios, we also developed some land use scenarios and this was done by our partners in Kiel. First we have a baseline scenario um, which is in the, in the upper left and you can see here that we already have a very high percentage of corn because in the last 10 to 15 years there was an increase in corn uh, as an energy crop. We have a food scenario where this share of corn even increases further. We have an alternative energy crop scenario where there are alternative energy crops which increase and where we have a decrease in the corn. And we have a best management scenario where we have a more balanced share of the different um, crops. Okay, in the, uh, on the following slide I would like to introduce the modeling framework to you and um, later on I will explain in more detail the different models and the results for the Träne catchment. So at, in the beginning we've got an eco-hydrological model. So I'm not sure what you know about uh, modeling in general so it might be that the following explanation, explanations are a little bit boring for some of you but I would like to be sure that, that everybody can follow and understands this modeling approach. We have an eco-hydrological eco model at the start of this modeling framework. These are catchment models to rainfall runoff models which use catchment data and river network data as an input and discharges the main output, so a hydrograph, but you also can model water quality aspects like nutrient loads, fine sediment loads or pesticides. The next model is a 1D hydrodynamic model which uses the discharge as an input and gives you the water level as an output and this is needed for the 2D hydrodynamic model of the study, study reach. The 2D hydrodynamic model um, needs channel bathymetry as an input 
so the form of the river, and together with the water level and the, and the discharge gives you, let's say, the hydraulic habitat conditions. And this in turn is used to assess the habitat suitability of these hydraulic habitats. And you might be also already be familiar with the term weighted usable area. So at the end, uh, you can assess the habitat suitability for a given discharge for the study reach. And to model this habitat suitability, you need some information on the um, species preferences, so the, the habitat preferences of the species. So this modeling approach has al already been applied by a colleague, by Jens Kiesel. And now we added some aspects in impact. The first one is that we looked at morphological changes. So we add this, these models here because we think that discharge changes can also have a significant effect on the morphology, which in turn affects the hydraulics and the habitat suitability. So this is the reason why we included here the, these morphological aspects. And second, we added dispersal modeling, and we did this because with habitat suitability, you are describing which species potentially can occur because the habitats are available. But it might be that these species are not present in the catchment or that their dispersal is limited due to migration barriers. So we added this line up here um, on the top where we use species distribution models to identify the source populations and then apply dispersion model to assess the recolonization potential. So the species which potentially can, can reach uh, these habitats which have been restored or which are present in our study reach. And finally, we have a kind of not model but biological assessment to combine all this information. So combine the information on which habitat are, ava are available, which species are available to colonize, these habitats and which other large-scale pressures are present which might limit biota in our study reach. And finally we have there are possible feedback mechanisms for example macrophytes which affect the flow and substrate conditions which we did not consider in our project but which we think should be considered. So um, this is rather complex and I would like to use this picture of Douglas Adams to say don't panic, I will explain all this in more detail in the, on the following slides. So as I mentioned before, at the start we have this eco-hydrological model and these eco-hydrological model usually give uh, such a hydrograph, so daily values of discharge during the modeling period. Now it's um, not really feasible and also not useful to model the habitat suitability for all these different daily values, um, but it, it's useful to extract some flow regime variables to describe this hydrograph and the changes in this hydrograph which is caused by climate change for example. What we did is that we considered the mean and the extremes and um, what you will see on the following slides are terms like Q75, which is the discharge exceeded or, uh, 75 days uh, per year, which means this is the low discharge. Q50 is the median discharge and Q25 is the one which is exceeded only 25 days per year, so this is a rather high discharge. And we calculated monthly values, so we also con consider the seasonality, which is very important, of course, for biota. You can imagine that changes during uh, spawning might be different uh, due, uh, compared to changes uh, in summer where um, the juveniles are already, uh, are already there. So what is the climate change effect on discharge in our study catchment, the Träne? What you can see here are three different graphs for the low flow, median flow and high flow conditions. And you see here 
box plots for the baseline and the climate change scenarios. And these box plots consist of these 100 climate change runs of the star scenario. <clears throat> you can see here that there, are only, that there are only minor changes in the winter month, but that we have large changes in discharge in the summer month and especially in the autumn, so in October, September and November. And this is true not only for the low flow, but also for the median flow and high flow conditions. So please remember, we have large changes in the discharge uh, due to climate change. As I said, we also looked at uh, land use changes and its effect on nutrient loads. And this is a graph showing you the four different scenarios. So the black bars are the baseline scenarios and the other bars are the scenarios uh, scenario runs for the three different land use scenarios, showing here the days above threshold, and threshold here is 0.3 milligram per liters for total phosphorus. And you can see here that all the bars are similarly high, so there is not really a change in phosphorus days of exceedance um, in the different scenarios. But for the nitrate, you can see here that there is a significant, significant decrease, especially in the best management scenario, um, so that the days where the nitrate threshold is uh, exceeded, uh, that there's a smaller days uh, where the um, threshold is exceeded, but still, even in the summer month, we have some days where this threshold is exceeded. So. What we conclude from this is that in the Trainer catchment, uh, we have ch changes in the nitrate concentrations, which are in in the range of the critical values, but we still have exceedance of the thresholds. Okay, this was the ecohydrological model, which gives you the discharge and water quality aspects. Second one is a 1D hydrodynamic model, which gives you the water level. And this is really standard, in, and I'm quite sure that you're familiar with this. Um, so what this model gives you is a rating curve, so a relationship between the discharge here on the x-axis and the water level on the y-axis. Um, and what you need as an input is the discharge and the water level at a gauging station. And what the model does is that it calculates the um, the water level between the gorging station, which is downstream of the study reach, up to the study, study reach. So it brings the information that you have from the gorging station um, up to the study reach. And here in our study reach, we have run a 2D hydrodynamic model, which gives, as I mentioned before, the hydraulic habitat conditions. And you need channel bathymetry for this. And before I show you the results of the 2D hydrodynamic model, I would like to talk a little bit about these morphodynamic or morphological models. So the idea behind this is that it might be that the channel bathymetry that we mapped during our field campaign was in this equilibrium. So that it's not a good representation of what you normally I have there as an as an bathymetry, so that it's not representative for the long-term conditions. So we were interested in modeling the equilibrium channel bathymetry and compare it to the mapped to decide if we use the mapped or equilibrium bathymetry for the 2D modeling. Unfortunately, there is no model available which can really predict the long-term evolution, morphological evolution um, of a channel. And that's why we used a stepwise approach in impact. So first we looked at the channel geometry. So this is the width, depth, and slope of the channel. And we used an empirical approach and we used a regime model which is more physically based, let's say. And the result is that we only have small changes in the bankful discharge and therefore only small changes in the width. So only about 9% decrease, uh, which is well within the range of uncertainty of these kind of models. 
So we concluded that we have no significant change uh, of channel morphology due to climate change, discharge changes in our catchment. Second, we used um, models to predict channel plane form and especially the dynamics of channel plane form. So it might be that these discharge, discharge change, changes um, are affecting how the channel is laterally moving on, um, in the floodplain. Here we used a model which is called Meandras and we found only very small changes in the migration rates. And that's why we think that also in respect to channel plane from the climate change in our study catchment has only very small effect. And finally, we looked at channel bathymetry. So we kept the banks fixed and we only looked how the channel bathymetry, so the bed levels, will change due to the discharge changes. And here we used a morphodynamic model which is called DEF3D. And as I mentioned before, we were also interested if the modeled equilibrium bathymetry differs from the mapped one. And yes, actually we found that the modeled bathymetry differs from the mapped one. Um, and this might be this might be an indication that really the mapped bathymetry is in this equilibrium, but we have macrophytes in this sandbed river. And we do think that probably the presence of this aquatic vegetation is affecting the morphology. And the problem is that presently there are not really good models to predict this effect of macrophytes on channel morphology. And that was the reason why we were, we were working with uh, the map bathymetry in the following. I will skip this slide. So, okay, we, now we use the map bathymetry for this 2D hydrodyna hydrodynamic model. And we did run this model for monthly values for the three different flow regime variables for two scenarios, so for the baseline and the climate change. So in some we have 72 model runs per scenario. And the output are these kind of maps of hydraulic variables. So what you can see here, here for example, is the flow velocity, um, flow velocity vectors, and the colors here indicate the flow velocity, red very high flow velocities, and blue um, small velocities. And these can be can be then used in the in the following. Um, just as one result, I would like to show you the shear stress values for the different flows in the different month. And, the, uh, and the, the plot here, the box plot here, gives you the values of, our, of all the grid cells of the computational grid. So what you have here are, in this model is a computational grid, so small grid cells uh, about 0.2 meters in width, and all these values are now included in these box plots. What I added here is a line indicating the critical shear stress of the bed material, material, which is sand, and you can see that for most of the flows and most of the year, we have shifting sand in this sand bed river and that there is only a small change in the climate change scenarios. So the box plots, the blue and the red box plots are rather similar. However, there is a decrease in shear stress in the summer month due to the decrease of the discharge. And in our op opinion, this is rather um, good for biota because this increases the areas of the bed where we have stable sand at summer low flows. Another way of looking at these results is to calculate the difference between the climate change and baseline scenario in percent. So for example, here you've got 25% decrease of discharge. These are the blue bars. Um, and the other bars represent the hydraulic variables like shear stress, velocity, and depth. And these are the three different flow regime variables we were looking at. And you can see here that it's very important to con consider seasonality because 
in the different months we have very different uh, effects of the discharge changes and the climate change effects. Um, we have very similar pattern for the three different flow regime variables. You can see, but there are two points which are really important. One is that you can see that the discharge changes do not really go fully in parallel with the hydraulic changes. So for example, the largest discharge change is, no, is in November here, but the largest hydraulic changes are in October. So you cannot really make conclusions from discharge values on the hydraulics, and this is due to the fact that the morphology of natural stream reaches is complex. So there's not a linear relationship between the discharge change and the hydraulic change. Another important aspect which you already saw on these figures on the shear stress is that hydraulic changes generally are lower than the uh, discharge changes, so that uh, these three bars here are not that big compared to the blue bars. Okay, now we know how the hydraulic habitat conditions are, and the next step is to model the habitat suitability. So which species can, for which species are these habitats suitable? For the fish, we used a fuzzy logic approach, which is well established. Um, and this fuzzy logic approach, approach is first of all, of course, based on the habitat conditions which are modeled by the hydrodynamic model. So for example, by the flow and velocity and depth. The second thing is that you have these kind of mem so-called membership functions. And this is where this fuzzy approach comes in because you're classifying the hydraulic variables in classes which overlap. So for example, you can see in the lower part here the classes for flow velocity, and you can see that these classes overlap in these areas. So for this value of 0.1, for example, there's a shared probability that it belongs to a very low flow conditions, uh, and low flow conditions. The next step is that you are assessing the habitat suitability for each possible combinations um, of these flow variables. So for example, if, if depth is very low and vol velocity is also very low, you can assess the suitability as, for example, being very high for juvenile fish. So this is the approach that is followed by uh, fuzzy logic. The output of this fuzzy logic approach is a suitability of each grid cell, model grid cell, which ranges uh, from 0 to 1. And then you can sum up all these grid cell values to the so-called weighted usable area, which is a single value for the whole study reach, which gives you the suitability for a given discharge in a given species. So these are the results for two different groups of fish species. Again, blue baseline scenario and red climate change scenario. Again, we have the 12 months, and here we have got a weighted usable area on the, x, on the y axis. And you can see here that for the large bodied fish, we have a decrease of the weighted usable area in summer already for the baseline scenario, which is clear because the large fish uh, need deep areas um, to live. And you can see that because of the decrease of the discharge and the de decrease of the depth, you all we have a more pronounced decrease of the weighted usable, usable area in the summer month. It's a little, little bit different for the small-bodied fish, Small-bodied fish need more shallow areas, and you can see that the weighted usable area increases in the summer month in the baseline scenario. Uh, and because due to the climate change decrease in discharge, you get smaller depth, uh, these shallow areas get too shallow in some month, 
so there is kind of depression or drop of the weighted usable area in the summer month for uh, these small bodied fish. So this is one of the main uh, results uh, in respect to fish. <coughs> for the inverts we used, used another approach and we actually developed a new model. Uh, this was done by Maria Schröder of the University of Essen. Um, and she developed the so-called habitat evaluation tool. So why did she do this? Um, with the habitat suitability models, you have weighted usable areas as an output. So you know if the, if the habitat is um, suitable for different species. However, you don't know how much weighted usable area a species needs to establish in the study reach. Uh, so you cannot really predict this, the um, presence and abundance of the species. For invertebrates, we have rather good empirical data which are habitat specific. So you might know that for the water framework directive, we are doing habitat specific sampling. So we are, for example, sampling only sand patches in a in a reach or only only the, the gravel patches. So we know which species are present on different substrates. And based on this empirical data, the habitat evaluation tool is predicting the presence and abundance of the species. So what you do have here is really uh, a really uh, a prediction of the presence, which you can base on calculations of metric values. I will give you more. Um, more more detailed description of this tool because I think it's a very good approach to um, link this um, habitat modeling to WFD metric uh, values and assessment methods. So what we have at the start is um, um, modeling, a modeling setup generating data set where you have uh, different samples which are substrate specific. You can calculate mean values for the abundance for all species on different substrates. And you can calculate the share that specific species have on a substrate. For example, this gamma rus here, uh, in this example, is um, has 100% of the abundance um, on sand. So 100 of, this, of the individuals occurring on sand belong to this, to this species. In the next step, you're doing a kind of virtual sampling. So you uh, convert these um, percentage values to integer values. And then you're doing a kind of random sampling on the different substrates. So for example, you are sampling from from these species here 10 times, so you draw a sample 10 times, and this number of 10 times comes from the mean abundance that is present on this substrate. And based on this sampling, virtual sampling, you get a number of, um, let's say, virtual samples, and you can use these virtual samples, which are substrate specific, to derive a composite text list. So you are creating these values that you get here. By the area which is covered by the different substrates, you get a text list. And you can calculate metric values and apply all kind of assessment methods as you do it for normal samples. OK, this is uh, the approach that we follow for the invertebrates. And as I said before, then you have the habitat suitability uh, and the species which might be present uh, given the habitats. But it might be that they cannot establish because they do not occur in the catchment or there are um, migration barriers which uh, hinder them to colonize. So that's why we included dispersal models in our modeling approach. So here um, we developed, namely Johannes Radinger developed at the first dispersal model, which is called FIDIMO. And this is 
three steps. The first one is that you have to locate the source populations. The second one is that you have to have some information on the dispersal abilities. And here Johannes did a meta analysis of mark recapture studies uh, to quantify this. And third, you've got to implement this in so being spatially explicit in a GIS. Last but not least, we have a complementary genetic approach in, the, in our project where we have cross-checked these dispersal abilities based on um, genetic data. So what FIDIMO does that um, it uses these kind of uh, curves that you can see here, this yellow curve, which gives you the probability of fish occurring at a specific distance of the source population. And this curve is applied on each of the source population that you can see on the left. So these are red dots which come from a species distribution model and which indicate that there are source populations. And this, this uh, curve is applied on each of these uh, dots and gives you then the probability of each grid cell of the river network for fish to, to occur. So this is the basic modeling approach uh, followed in FIDIMO. For the invertebrates, we used another approach, and this has two reasons. The first one is that uh, we don't have such nice mark recapture studies for invertebrates, uh, because taking stoneflies is very difficult. Um, and second, we have different um, life stages for the invertebrates, um, which makes it necessary to model different movements, like we have, of course, terrestrial life stages uh, for some species, so we also have to model terrestrial movement. And here we've, we used a so-called least cost modeling approach, and here you, you have a, a modeling area, and uh, you rasterize this modeling area, so we have grid cells. And you assign costs to all these grid cells to pass them. So, for example, it's, it's much uh, easier for, um, for a terrestrial life stage to cross um, grassland, for example, than urban areas. And finally, you can sum up all the costs to move from a sink, which is your study area, to a source population, or the other way around, for the source populations to move to your, to your study region. And this least, least cost modeling has already been applied in terrestrial um, ecosystems, but it's less common to apply this in river ecosystems. As I said before, we are still working the final results for this dispersal modeling, unfortunately. So finally, we have a kind of biological assessment to combine this uh, available habitats, the available species, and information on the other pressures. So for the invertebrates, we have found a way to co combine the effect of um, the habitats availability, so the substrates, and the large-scale pressures like nutrient loads. And we will do this <coughs> um, by developing so-called dose-response relationships that you can see here in this, in this graph. So the dose is the nutrient or pesticide load that you have here on the x-axis, and the response is here on the y-axis, the abundance um, uh, of uh, invertebrate species. So if you have a very low nu nutrient load, you have a very high abundance, and this is the abundance that you can uh, assume uh, if you have calibrated the habitat evaluation tool using natural uh, natural reaches, natural sampling points. So now if you have, have a higher nutrient load, this abundance decreases. So and this, and this result gives you a kind of correction fa factor that you can use. So for example, if you've got more than 50% uh, nutrient load in this example, you have a correction factor of 0.6, so you're multiplying the abundance that you get from the habitat evaluation tool by 0.6. So this is a way of incorporating this large-scale 
uh, pressures like nutrient loads uh, in this modeling approach. Finally, um, we have found one way to combine the effect of this habitat suitability, which also includes the nutrient loads, so NNP, and the recolonization potential. We did not find a fully quantitative approach, but we have, uh, would like to su suggest a more uh, applied approach to combine these two things. And the approach is to rank species according to the recolonization potential and rank them according to the habitat suitability. And then to combine this to assess the potential restoration effect that you can, um, that you might have. So, for example, you've got, you got species A here, which has a very high recolonization, recolonization potential and which has a very high habitat suitability in the study reach. And here you can expect a large effect in the short term. The other way around for species F, uh, with a low recolonization potential and a low habitat suitability, where you can expect a small effect in the long term. And of course, you can also find species with a small effect on the short term or a large effect on the long term. And of course, you can also add more classes here. So for example, short, midterm, and long term, and large effects, mid-sized effect, and small effect. So <clears throat> I would like to, I only have two more slides. Uh, one is on sensi sensitivity and uncertainty. Um, which is also an upcoming objective that we have, because we have these different models coupled in the modeling approach. We would like to investigate how sensitive the output is to changes in the input. Since we uh, coupled the models manually, we are not able to include many parameters in this kind of sensitivity analysis, because including many parameters also, then you need also to have ma many model runs. But we would like to look especially at discharge uncertainty, which comes from the climate change modeling, uh, roughness uncertainty, which comes from the effect of the macrophytes in our sand bed uh, study, study catchment, and we would like to include the um, uncertainty which comes from the expert judgment on the habitat suitability of fish. And our hypothesis is that the expert judgment has a much larger effect, or the uncertainty that we have in the expert judgment has a much larger effect on the output compared to the uncertainty of roughness or the uncertainty that, that we have in the climate change models. So to summarize all this in one slide, which is really difficult, um, I would like to point out that we developed a new modeling framework and we developed two more tools or models for the habitat suitability and for the fish dispersal, which was done by Maria Schröder and Johannes Radinger. And we found it really challenging to couple the physical and biological models because we have very high level of detail in the physical models for some aspects like hydraulics, which we don't need for the biological models. However, we would need some more models to predict, for example, the organic substrates uh, and the effect of macrophytes on flow and on, on morphology, which are not available, which would be much more interesting, which would be much more interesting compared to having more detailed physical modeling. And third, we applied this modeling approach, which all the difficulties described here in our case study catchments. And indeed, we found that the different biological groups are limited by different pressures. So the climate change effect on discharge will lead, probably lead really to a change in the weighted usable area, especially in, in a decrease of the weighted usable area in autumn, which probably is much more influential than the land use effects on, um, on nutrient loads. For the invertebrates, we uh, uh, assess that the effect of climate change will be minor, but land use um, change um, changes the, the, the nutrient loads at critical levels. 
of course, you have seen that this is the first application and that we are facing many, many problems. And um, of course, it, it, is, it is necessary to refine this model in the future. And that it's just a first, um, first try to combine all these kind of models. OK, and finally, I would like to thank uh, especially the funding agencies, but also the agencies which provided data for our modeling approach. And I would like to thank you for Thank you very much, Jochen, uh, for your very good and uh, clear, even if uh, not easy, presentation. Uh, some people, uh, we, we have uh, time for questions, so please uh, uh, help me to, to put some questions to Joachim. Uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, you, you know, Joachim, this is a research project, uh, but uh, our participants uh, uh, have uh, uh, work uh, also in, uh, in in some group who have to solve practical problems, uh, and uh, so my question is, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, your uh, uh, idea uh, about the use of this uh, approach? Uh, we can't, uh, we, we can, uh, uh, we have to model every basin. Uh, and every basin is uh, uh, a particular case, or uh, is possible to uh, obtain general results uh, to use also to in other uh, situation. And uh, we can model only climate change, or uh, we can uh, use this approach, for example, uh, to define in a in a better way the minimum ecological flow, or uh, or other. Issues. <clears throat> okay, um, that's a very good question. Um, of course, this is a research project, and, and as I mentioned before, the idea was to uh, um, kind of disentangling the effect of l land use um, on on biota, and to to look if you if we if, for example, nutrient loads really could be the reason. Uh, why we find this large effect of um, catchment and pressures on biota. So I think when we apply this approach in some catchments, we can get a much better idea if really, for example, nutrient loads could be the bottleneck. Uh, if it turns out that nutrient loads are below critical levels, uh, of course, you don't have to apply this kind of very complex modeling approach. So I think you can select different modules of this modeling approach if you are sure that specific pressures are not present or not limit limiting in your catchment. Um, I think what is interesting for uh, practitioners is to have a broader view on what affects biota and um, to really have this catchment scale approach, which is also um, implicit in the Water Framework Directive. And of course, it's not only climate change which can be assessed using this kind of modeling approach, but any other pressure which affects um, discharge or water quality aspects. OK. Other question? I, I was a bit surprised that uh, Phosphorus doesn't change uh, uh, in different uh, scenarios of uh, climate change uh, and uh, sorry of uh, 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 land use. Uh, wh why phosphorus uh, doesn't change while nitrogen uh, change uh, uh, in a significant way? Uh, good, good question. Um, so I'm not uh, an expert for this, but. The, um, one explanation is that in the land use change scenarios, um, there's not much difference between um, the uh, the areas which are covered by vegetation. So, okay. um, 
so we don't have much, also much change in the fine sediment loads. Um, that's why perhaps phosphorus is not changing that much. Um, there are changes in um, nitrate because the different uh, crops are uh, connected to different fertilizer loads. And these fertilizer, lo fertilizer loads go in these, uh, are, um, are included and um, considered in the in the different land to scenarios. Okay. And that's why the, 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 it's perhaps less a question of um, uh, processes which bring the, the nutrients from the field to the river. It's more a question of how the application of nutrients changes in the different scenarios. Okay. Uh, any other question? I, I see Mattia is typing, so probably we have the first uh, question on chat. Uh, I don't want uh, to be uh, the only one talking with uh, Joachim, so please uh, send me some question. So while Matthias is typing, one question that I would have to the participants of this e-seminar is: um, What is what are your what are your needs? Are you more familiar with this kind of um, let's say uh, hydraulic engineering models, and you need more information on the biological models, or um, would you say all these kind of models are of interest to you? That's because that's something, in, the question is, where should we focus our research in the future? So if anybody has an idea on this, it would be very great to hear about this. Okay, the first question is coming from uh, ARPA Valdaosta, which is the environmental agency uh, of uh, this uh, Italian region in, in the Alps. and. Uh, you can read, uh, do you think uh, feasible to use this kind of modelization thresholds and metrics coming from a water framework di directive? Um, yes, I, I do think, uh, especially for the, for the invertebrates um, where we have, at least in Germany, um, quite a number of, um, of sampling sites. Um, it's possible to calculate the biological metrics that we also use for the water from directive and to directly uh, combine this habitat evaluation tool to these assessment methods. Um, of course, there are some kind of, uh, kind of uh, critics and drawbacks. So, for example, in this habitat evaluation, at the moment we're using substrate because was because we have substrate specific information for the samples. If we would have also hydraulic information for the samples, so about the flow conditions, we could also connect um, the presence and abundance of the invertebrate species to these kind of variables. Unfortunately, unfortunately nobody is really measuring hydraulics when they are going sampling or not measuring hydraulics at the range of flow conditions so that we can um, have a good relationship between um, the presence and abundance of the species and um, the flow conditions. So there are some restrictions, but I think, um, yes, we could, we al already did it. So Ma Maria Schröder did calculate uh, this German uh, uh, assessment met uh, metrics uh, for our study reach and we can directly connect it to the WFD. Uh, and do you think uh, you need to to have a model for each uh, basin or a sub basin, or uh, we can uh, use uh, a pilot basin to export the results uh, also in a similar, for example, uh, Alpine uh, uh, basin? Uh, every basin is another story, or or, or not? Uh, as I said before, I think if you can rule out that there are some large-scale pressures uh, limiting, you can apply, for example, the habitat evaluation, to, evaluation tool uh, to many catchments and you, you just have to, to calibrate it once. So if you have, have for example, 
uh, samples for, for alpine streams, you can assume that the, the relationship between presence and abundance and uh, substrates are similar in all these kind in uh, in, a, in a similar stream type. Of course, you you I think you have to be stream type specific, specific. So you cannot transfer results from the alpine rivers to lowland muddy yeah. uh, large rivers, for example. Yes. Other question. Mattia, are you typing? Ah, thank you. And uh, I have uh, my last question. Um, according to to the experience uh, of uh, impact project, which are the 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 main uh, problem uh, to to solve? Uh, about model, I mean, uh, is um, we saw you have problem. We have not uh, still model for macrophytes. Uh, uh, probably hydraulic model uh, uh, are not so problematic. Uh, and uh, what's about uh, geomorphological model? We have to work uh, on that uh, to improve uh, them, or, or uh, the results uh, are uh, are good now. Um. Yes, I think um, there are two aspects. The first one is with the morphodynamic models that because especially invertebrates are more clearly linked to the substrate, of course it would be good to have some idea of the changes of the substrate conditions. So for example of the, the grain size. And all this sorting modeling in, in morphodynamics is really complex. Um, and it's um, it's 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 difficult to to model the sorting. There are some processes which are not resolved, and I think it's also difficult to um, not being overly detailed um, at levels which are not um, important for biota. Uh, so to so find a, a, um, a balance between uh, improving this kind of uh, sorting modelings and um, 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 grain size modeling um, and n improving it at a level which is of importance for biota, so at, let's say, a, a patch scale, and not, go not going too much into detail. Um, the second one is that we, we have problems with this kind of biological models because these are still, of course, empirical models, so we are relying on empirical data. And we don't have any connection to really um, physiography of the animals or anything like this. So we, we rely on empirical data on for this uh, biological models. Okay. Uh, we try now to give the microphone to Bernard de la Cour. Uh, Elisa, please uh, switch on the microphone. Hi, Bernard. I I don't know if you can talk, Bernard. I see that uh, the symbol of the microphone open, so please try to talk. Bernard, yeah, can you hear talking. me? Ah, he's talking, but we can't hear him. Okay, uh, probably you have uh, to. Uh, to put uh, to work on the volume. In the meantime, uh, we we have a uh, other question. <coughs> Enrico Marchese from the University of Bolzano. What do you th uh, do? You think that is possible to mitigate as per judge judgment uncertainty with some specific habitat assessment index? Uh, I must admit, I. I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. So uh, I do understand that we have some uncertainty in the expert judgment, and that we can kind of have a workaround if we have uh, more, let's say, habitat preference curves or something like this. 
So if this is the question, then um, um, we have the problems uh, I, with... I, sh I suppose uh, you, you refer to some uh, habitat uh, assessment index uh, based uh, on uh, measures, uh, empirical measures, and so uh, it is possible uh, to use them uh, in parallel with uh, expert judgment uh, to to reduce uh, the the uncertainty of the expert judgment. Um, Is it okay, Matt? Yes, Enrico? yes. Actually, I think we have to to um, distinguish between fish and invertebrates. For invertebrates. I think this is already somehow included in this habitat evaluation tool. So we are using empirical relationships between um, the invertebrates and the habitats to do this kind of modeling. For fish, we have the problem that um, um, it's very difficult to, to get this kind of habitat preferences from sampling. Uh, at least um, the fish ecologists, our colleagues, were very concerned about this standard um, uh, empirical relationships between fish and habitats. I don't know if this is answering the question. <laughs> yes, another problem is that uh, uh, usually in the habitat model uh, you have, uh, in any case, some uh, uh, part based on expert judgment, uh, for example, the fuzzy model. Mm. So probably uh, we have always uh, this kind of, uh, of problem. Uh, another question uh, is uh, uh, from uh, Bernard. Uh, you can you can write uh, you can read the, the question, uh, Joachim, because it's very long to, to read. Is about the um, meander yes. morphology. Yes, um, we were also surprised to only see small changes because, uh, based on the predictions we were aware of for northern Germany, um, we expected an increase of the uh, winter uh, storm flows. Um, now, actually, the, uh, the 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 winter high flows didn't uh, increase in this in this watershed, and so that's why the this, these are the kind of channel forming discharges, so which have the highest effect on the morphology in respect to their magnitude. So, um, and because of this, because we had only minor changes in these high discharges, we only also have only minor changes in uh, on the general morphology. So yes, we were also surprised. There is some, um, perhaps it's not the really perfect case study catchment because it's in the northern part of Germany, but also located between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea, and it's um, it's um, so climate change effects are kind of reduced due to this very marine marine environment. So. We have another catchment, which is the Sile, where we have uh, a larger effect of climate change and discharge, but um, we have not we have not finalized um, um, our modeling there. Okay, uh, another question. So, sorry, Hervé. Uh, what is the time needed to make uh, this kind of integrating model in an objective of uh, a operating management? So this is a classical question of uh, what are these projects? When uh, we can use uh, results coming from research? Okay. So does this refer to the time needed to apply the approach in an, another catchment, or is that a question? Please uh, write. Uh, In the chat. Uh, 
So in case it's it's about applying this uh, modeling approach in another catchment, um, uh, yes, um, I think most um, most work is to set up this kind of hydrological model. Um, uh, so we spend most effort in this. Uh, um, so if we ha if we have basic data, especially sampling data in the catchment, it's some work to do, do this kind of statistical analysis to for the uh, biological models. So for the habitat evaluation tool and for for this um, dispersal modeling. But it's um, I would say that um, besides this hydrological modeling. Uh, to s set up the dispersal model and uh, um, uh, also the 2D hydro hydrodynamic model, it's about six person month, something like this. Okay, so a long work. <laughs> yes, a, a long work for pract uh, for practitioners, uh, short work for research. Yes. So, but as so I mentioned right, before, it's something more. Okay. But I it's think clear. I have to to, to, to mention that this uh, was a research project uh, to to look if you really have the bottlenecks uh, in uh, if you really the bottlenecks are caused by these large scale pressures, and if we if you can be sure that some pressures are not present in your catchment, you can of course select some of the modules of the modeling framework, which of course then will. Uh, minimize <coughs> the effort. Yes. Okay. Uh, no more question. Okay. Another question coming from Valdaosta. Or not? Mattia, have you some more question? No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, I want to thank uh, all participants. Uh, I want to thank also Elisa, who make uh, good work in, to organize and to manage uh, the um, seminar. And obviously, I want to thank uh, Joachim for uh, his uh, uh, presence. Uh, we, we can stop here. We will send to all participants uh, an audience questionnaire, which uh, uh, require one minute. Uh, uh, is not important for, for you, but is important for us. So uh, if you could send uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, we can uh, improve uh, uh, our job. Thank you and uh, uh, see you on next uh, event uh, if, uh, if you want. Bye bye Bruno, from Bruno. Hello. Okay, bye.